Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to come uh, to Singapore and talk about a topic that's been sort of part of my life forever, and that's sedation. But uh, really to make you think a little bit now um, about what you're doing when you do sedate people and why are you sedating them. So um, we'll get the first slide, hopefully. Yeah, first of all, disclosures. I do get research grants from Massimo Corporation. Thank you, Massimo. Um, but when your patients come in for various unpleasant procedures, whether it's surgery, whether it's in the ICU, mechanical ventilation, we've routinely tended to sedate them uh, with the idea this would be kind. Uh, we want to be kind to our patients. We don't want to hurt them. Uh, and yet there's more and more data beginning to come out related to the problems of deep sedation that maybe that alters the electrical activity of the brain to the point that particularly if you're elderly, those circuits don't come back again and that you can't relearn some of the things that you had learned when you were younger. Uh, and from animal work, if you put people under heavy sedation or anesthesia, perhaps there's some neurotrophic uh, problem, apoptosis of brain cells that actually damage the cells, again, particularly in the elderly and particularly in our young patients. And so I just want to go through some of the data that's out there and uh, stimulate you to think about what you're doing and perhaps uh, we ought to be looking at the brain much the way, same way as we look at the heart and we ought to monitor it a little bit more closely and that way perhaps we could answer some of these questions um, and uh, be a little bit more precise about how we care for our patients uh, using these drugs very selectively. So it's been known for uh, quite a number of years that if we take people down to burst suppression on the EEG, uh, that's exactly as it sounds, a burst and then suppression, um, that uh, it can have uh, uh, some bad outcomes related to it in terms of um, increased mortality and also post-operative cognitive uh, problems. And there's been a number of articles written about this over the years. It, it keeps coming up there, whether it's in the ICU or whether it's in the operating room. If we take people to burst suppression for any length of time, uh, this can be a problem. Uh, it can show as delirium when the patients now are reawoken, and delirium does seem to be a cardinal sign of brain dysfunction. And again, um, if people have cognitive impairment um, after critical illness uh, related to delirium, uh, it can be profound. And this work from Vanderbilt, uh, and Wazidi's group have done a lot of this work. Uh, if you have uh, delirium in the ICU, it can be associated uh, with worse global cognition and executive function scores uh, at three months that are equivalent in 40% of patients to a traumatic brain injury. And uh, that, that is pretty uh, profound. And we're in the United States, where I practice now, uh, very concerned about um, concussion, not just from the football players when it occurs at the time, because now they've been pulled out of the game and they have to rest for up to a week before they're allowed to play again, but we're concerned about the long-term problems of concussion. That transient brain injury seems to relate to, to release glutamate, glutamates and uh, you get this vicious cycle so that we visit these football players 10 years out and cognitively they're challenged. Uh, they're not the same people as they were playing the football game. So there's great concern now and a lot of uh, research being done into head injury. But is this related to what we're doing in the ICU or what we're doing uh, to our patients in the operating room? Well, th there's some concern about this, I think, from the literature that's been put out there. The late Tom Petty uh, put out this sort of famous quote, uh, and unfortunately we see it still today in some ICUs, where you'll walk around and find people on mechanical ventilation, and they're totally comatosed, purely from drugs. And when you ask why are they comatosed, well, they're on the ventilator. And I think most of us now are moving away from that, 
and looking at sedation only when we really have to sedate people uh, deeply because of um, reverse IE ratios, things that on the ventilator that the patient couldn't tolerate uh, being awake. And we know that the outcomes of patients who've been uh, deeply sedated, uh, you can find a year later. And I certainly, when I uh, got involved with trying to develop a sedation scoring system, one of the reasons was that when I looked at our ARDS outcomes in London in the 70s, we had a success rate of probably 20%. That meant 80% of those patients died. So when you looked at the success, if you called the patient's family um, a year later, and I did that a lot to see how dad was doing, they'll tell you, oh, dad's doing great. And you say, well, what's he doing now? Well, he's sitting in front of the television. Well, is he watching the television? No, 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 he, he's just looking at the television. And that was a success. And clearly it wasn't. Now, so many things go on with that brain. It's not just sedation, it's not just uh, uh, burst suppression, it's inflammation, it's hypoxia, uh, it, it's all poor perfusion. Many, many things have gone on with that brain. Uh, but until we start to monitor the brain and really look at what we're doing, we're not gonna get to the answer of where we can protect that brain. So uh, over sedation, we now know, is bad in the ICU if it's not necessary. Uh, so how do we measure consciousness? We don't really have a consciousness meter, or do we? I think we're starting to understand a little bit more now about the electrical activity of the brain, that uh, we do understand much more now about consciousness. It is more to do with connectivity. It is related to corticothalamic connectivity and those circuits, and that when we break those circuits, we're unconscious, even though the brain itself is not asleep. The brain itself is buzzing like crazy. All this work from Emory Brown will show you that that brain is really working, but the patient's unconscious. And maybe that's the safety area that we need to have patients in. Maybe we don't need them totally suppressed, where perhaps for our elderly uh, population, those circuits don't come back as they were. So I came up with that sedation score, it's simple. The whole idea was just trying to look at one factor that was affecting the brain in patients critically ill in the ICU, and that was the drugs we gave them. It was trying to get people to titrate the drug to a response as opposed to a dose. But sedation scales, and this came from Rick Riker, um, you know, they are a little bit like the Olympic uh, uh, judges in terms of the ice skating. You know, it, it does vary on the bias of who's doing the judging. So I got, was part of this uh, task force, and uh, the guideline task force, if any of you get asked to do it, I would advise you to turn it down. It's incredibly hard work, it really is, and it takes a long time. Um, but basically what came up with treat pain first. If somebody's comfortable, maybe they don't need to be sedated. Uh, and lighter sedation is better than deep sedation. Patients do better. Delirium is bad because it's a sign of a brain dysfunction. And so the outcomes, the sequelae of delirium are bad in terms of increased mortality. Uh, so we want to get our patients up, mobilize them, uh, what are the treatments for delirium? We still really don't have good treatments for delirium, so let's try and protect our patients from delirium, and maybe having them cognitively challenged and with it would be a protection. Uh, and uh, so the ICUs now are much more animated. We've got patients mobile. Certainly in our ICU, we'll have patients walking around, even on ECMO, if it's in the upper torso and not in the lower limbs. And so, um, I think a whole concept of how we manage sedation is changing, and it's changing for the better, because these patients do better. They're not in the ICU so long, they're not in the hospital so long, uh, they go home and they're not looking at the TV, they're looking at what's going on. Uh, so why should we care about the brain? Why should we monitor the brain? Well, it's all about you and cognition. I mean, none of you could do the job you do if you didn't have a very high IQ. If you had any impairment of your cognition, you couldn't do what you do today. And so it's very precious, and we have to protect it. And you know, we're just scratching the surface at the moment of what we can do to protect it, but I think the more we think about it, the more we look at what we're doing, uh, we'll get these answers.
This uh, is now, this was published in the United States this, earlier this year, uh, and it looked at the cognition of our youngsters, and that maybe anesthesia and some of these drugs could hurt the cognition of our youngsters. And this comes out of animal work. There's no doubt that up to non-human primates, we can show brain cell death in animals exposed to anesthetic drugs. And so uh, this was published too just recently, uh, looking at uh, some of the uh, key points. The developing aging brain could be vulnerable to anesthesia-induced neurotoxicity. Uh, this whole idea of anesthesia-induced neurotoxicity is out there. Uh, is it true in humans or isn't it? And I think um, we're seeing this year more data coming out that maybe it's not true in humans, but we don't know that answer for sure. Uh, certainly the earlier data was very clear that uh, cohorts of children who underwent um, anesthesia in the first four years of life, uh, you could show developmental problems with them as they got older. Now that was all retrospective, but one of the key elements of neuronal development depends on the balance between neurotransmitters, in particular glutamate and GABA. Now glutamate is what we're concerned about with traumatic brain injuries and perhaps causing more brain destruction in a vicious circle, but uh, GABA is something that most of the sedation drugs we use affects. They're all GABAergic drugs. Could this have anything to do with uh, brain dysfunction? Well, uh, Hench, uh, Taoka Hench uh, has done a lot of work on brain development, uh, looking at these windows where the brain uh, has a, a, an episode of where it can learn things like sensory or motor or language abilities, mathematical abilities, that these certain windows occur during uh, child development. And if they miss that window because of, he was looking at uh, inflammation from diseases, influenza, things like that, that uh, that child could get hurt in its mental behavior. Development. Well, when he's looked at some of the drugs that can affect it, GABA is one of them. So uh, the GABA area, which is the drugs that we use, many of our sedation drugs work in that area, uh, maybe this has effect on neurodevelopment. The FDA, unfortunately, I think, uh, this year came out with these warnings uh, that we have to put on consent forms for anesthesia and sedation now in the US and it names just about every drug you can, that you're likely to use uh, for anesthesia. And it says, we should discuss with child health professionals, the, or the parents should, potential adverse effects of anesthesia on brain development, as, a, as well as appropriate timing of procedures that can be delayed without jeopardizing the child's health. Now that's very concerning on circumstantial evidence. We don't know for sure that what we're doing is hurting the brain. And I want to show you a few very recent articles that uh, perhaps counteract this. Um, like this one from Weiss et al. Anesthetists rather than anesthetics are a bigger threat to baby brains. In other words, hypoxia, hypotension, hypocarbia may be worse for the brain than the drugs that we're using. And uh, his group did a study of a cohort of 400 plus patients and uh, really didn't show any abnormalities in those that had an anesthetic under the age of four. Uh, another group uh, published in the in Journal of American Medical Association, and this was uh, from Sweden, and uh, looked at a very large cohort of patients. And basically, they almost came down and said it didn't cause a problem. Unfortunately, they they weren't 100% about it. So there's still a concern out there that uh, maybe we could be hurting the brains. But on the other hand, you've got to look at it in the light of uh, the adverse effect of postponing surgery. That's essential surgery for the child. And so uh, this led to an editorial by Weiss, who's, who's really, I think, uh, feels that there's not a lot of real substance to this. Um, and most of this work, as he puts up there, uh, came from animals. The neurodegeneration and neurocognitive impairment um, comes from animal work, young animals, and very little human substance, substantial evidence to show that this is true. But 
we still don't know. Uh, and this was the um, uh, conclusion. Ultimately, it seems unlikely that anesthetic drugs exposure in young children will be identified as correlating with long-term neurocognitive outcomes. Attention now must be directed to more important environmental, medical, and individual factors, like who's taking care of your child. But we still don't know. Uh, here's uh, another cohort that came from Ruth Graham's uh, group of children. The conclusions that they came up to was these findings refute the assumption that earlier the GA exposure in children, the greater the likelihood of long-term neurocognitive risk. However, when you look into the data that she's showing, paradoxically, single exposure between two and four years of age was associated with deficits, most significant for communication, general knowledge. Well, that is a concern if you're between two and four and you're the parent of that child. So uh, not totally whitewashing this at all in, the, in that study. Uh, we do know uh, from the Australian, New Zealand study, <coughs> sorry, uh, from Kate Leslie, that uh, deeper anesthetic with uh, deeper uh, BIS values resulted in poorer outcomes in terms of survival. In other words, those patients that uh, had an absence of BIS value less than 40 uh, for more than five minutes had an improved survival uh, to those who didn't. So we're coming back to depth of anesthesia now, as opposed to maybe neurotoxic problems of anesthesia. And it'd be interesting to see how this latest study comes out, uh, because it again is looking at one year mortality and uh, depth of anesthesia. We do know delirium is bad, uh, certainly in our older patients, uh, and uh, it's associated with uh, uh, increased mortality and also increased cognitive problems as we follow it. De significant decline in cognitive ability uh, one year after cardiac surgery in patients who have delirium postoperatively. And it certainly got into our public media, and so elderly patients coming in now uh, will come and ask us, please do not put me too deep under anesthesia. It used to be, I don't want to be awake, don't let me be aware under anesthesia. Now they're coming to us asking, please don't put us too deep. So it's got to the general population, uh, and uh, maybe there's something to that. But that's a little different from being neurotoxic. Um, if we look at this study, which came from the Oxford group, I think it really is a neat study. It looked at uh, prospectively at two groups of elderly patients. And it looked at those who had no evidence of cognitive decline undergoing surgery. And they did as well as any other uh, control patient, um, younger patient. No difference at all. They didn't show any acceleration in cognitive decline. If you could pick up cognitive decline in that elderly patient before surgery and anesthesia, and I say surgery and anesthesia because this all may be surgery. It may not be anesthesia at all. Um, those that had evidence of cognitive decline deteriorated much more rapidly after surgery and anesthesia than those patients who had the cognitive decline but didn't undergo surgery. So in other words, you had to have a problem first before uh, we could see a problem after surgery and anesthesia. But there are many causes of brain failure, as we know in the ICU, uh, as well as surgery. Uh, all these different causes uh, of um, neurologic failure. How do we know which one we're dealing with or what is the causative factor if we don't monitor the brain? And so this came from Vanderbilt, this cartoon, but basically, you know, the sick patient got toxin exposures, neuronal damage, uh, impaired perfusion, increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier. The brain's exposed to toxins. It can get hurt. And we look at it, what can we do about it? Well, for the inflammation, maybe there's some anti-inflammatory drugs we could use, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, hypoxia, certainly, maybe we can improve oxygenation of the brain. Maybe we have earlier institution of things like uh, ECMO, but if we're gonna do that, you need to be monitoring the brain to know that it's occurring. Um, so there's some things that if we monitor the brain, maybe, we could treat and uh, avoid the problems. Uh, certainly, uh, we know that oxygen delivery to the brain, it doesn't take long 
before we've got irreversible brain damage if we take oxygen away from the brain. But I did mention surgery, and surgery causes an inflammatory response. That's part of the healing. You don't heal if you don't have inflammation. But if those inflammatory cytokines get to the brain, that can cause problems. And that's been shown well in the animal model that it causes cognitive decline uh, just by causing the trauma of surgery from the inflammatory cytokines. And the work of Mervyn Mays group showed that if you put a blocker in, an IL-1 beta blocker, a drug called anakinra, <coughs> excuse me, um, you can prevent that inflammation, you prevent the cognitive decline, but you also prevent wound healing. So it's too powerful. But maybe some of the more milder anti-inflammatory drugs might be part of what we do to protect the brain from surgery, not from anesthesia or sedation, but from surgery. So dexmedetomidine does have a mild anti-inflammatory reaction. And there's some data that it prevents delirium in children, uh, early excitation post-operative de delirium in children. There's some work that's shown that xenon might be protective. And this month in, an in anesthesia analgesia, there's some work showing that even ketamine might have some protective effect on the brain. So there's some drugs out there that maybe will be useful. Again, unless we monitor the brain, we won't know. Well, what are you going to monitor for? Here are the EEG changes related to a uh, patient in delirium. But I put it to you that most of you wouldn't recognize these changes if you saw them on the EEG. But this interesting work from New Zealand, uh, from Jamie Slade's group, I think is very interesting if it pans out into all areas of delirium. But he looked at children waking up from an inhalational anesthetic. And here's the spectrogram of a child that's going to wake up normally. No post-anesthetic uh, excitation. Uh, nice and compact and uh, uh, symmetrical uh, spectrogram. See the difference of a child that's going to wake up delirious? So maybe that's a marker. Maybe finally we've got a marker that we could uh, use, and uh, then we'd know whether dexmedetomidine prevented delirium. You could give it and see whether or not you got that trace. Um, or, or you got that one. So I think, again, if we start to monitor, uh, we've got some potential opportunities. Uh, the EEG, I think, can serve us a lot of different ways, just like the EKG. Uh, and I think using spectrograms can be very helpful. Makes it a little easier to understand. So just to close up with, this came from the American Geriatric Society. How do you prevent post-operative delirium in older patients? Well, their recommendation as non-anesthesia folk is that the anesthesia practitioner may use processed EEG monitors of anesthetic depth uh, to, during intravenous sedation or anesthesia uh, to help reduce post-op delirium, the inference being lighter may be better. We still come back to this lighter sedation, lighter anesthesia. The European Society of Anesthesia have just come out with a consensus-based guideline, and again, what they've said, all patients monitoring of anesthesia depth avoid deep anesthesia. <coughs> so is it time for precision brain monitoring? Will this help us protect the brain and cognition of our patients? I think, uh, I think the time probably is now uh, because you can't manage what you don't measure. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much, uh, Professor Ramsey. Hope uh, that's woken us all up. We do have time for some questions, if you wish. There's two microphones back here, and also I should have mentioned at the start, if you have the conference app on your device, then you can actually use it to uh, postulate questions, which we can see up here. So um, have a bit of fun with that during the conference. Uh, are there any questions for Professor Ramsey? Well, I'm happy to start with a question. Okay, um, Danielle. You mentioned regarding the uh, FDA guidelines about um, disclosing risks of cognitive effects on children of anaesthetics. What sort of impact is that going to have for elective and non-elective surgery for children um, who need operations? Well, it's got the parents now, as you can imagine, if you're a parent of a three-year-old and you're going to bring it in to have a tonsillectomy, you know, what can you do to protect my child? And right now, we really don't have answers to that, uh, other than to explain what the literature is showing, which is that uh, if your child needs that tonsillectomy, then he ought to have the tonsillectomy, uh, because the data on humans 
is not that solid. In fact, the latest data is probably more to the point of go ahead and have the surgery than don't have the surgery, as long as it's necessary. So we come back down to, you know, obviously don't undergo a procedure if you really don't need to. But um, I think if you've got infected tonsils and uh, these are affecting your child's uh, uh, life, then it's going to be much better to get rid of those because what's going to happen from the inflammation, the toxin, all those other things that can hurt the brain. Uh, and uh, so far, nobody's really shown that uh, our anesthetic or sedation drugs can cause neurotoxin, brain cell death. Um, so uh, I think uh, you'd think with, by now, with the number of kids that have gone through anesthesia, the cohorts that have been looked at and published, um, that if there was something really significant there, we'd have seen it. So either the brain's got just a wonderful adaptive power of overcoming um, uh, small amounts of injury and that uh, it's imperceptible, uh, but uh, it certainly, certainly does not look that way in animals. Um, but uh, from, from the provider's perspective, the parents are now much more anxious, there's no doubt about it. Um, and uh, we just wonder why the FDA decided to put it out this year. And uh, maybe last year there was more data out there. This year the data seems to be more supportive of the fact that anesthetic and sedation drugs are safer provided you manage them appropriately. Okay, well, thank you for that. We actually have a question on the app, so well done to the first one. It asks, uh, is there a place for the use of ketamine in ICU sedation? Uh, I think there is. Uh, as I say, there's just a slight uh, indication there that um, maybe ketamine could be neuroprotective, but I think more to the point, it's, it's very good uh, for pain management. And I think an infusion of ketamine cuts down the use of opioids. And certainly the data that's just come out of the CDC in the States is it only takes two to five days exposure to opioids to get you on a tract of opioid dependence. I mean, it really is scary data that's just come out. Uh, and uh, so if you can reduce opioids or even get them out of the uh, whole uh, area and just go with drugs like the non-steroidals, ketamine, et cetera, regional anesthesia for pain management, maybe we'll do our patients a service. All right. Uh, another yes. question from the audience. Hello, David Morgan from Australia. How much of delirium do you think is actually unmasking people with previous cognitive uh, disabilities that we're just unaware of and therefore should anaesthetists actually be doing in their preoperative assessment a, a greater assessment of their neurocognitive state so that we've got a better idea on the other side, intensive care, when they become delirious? I don't, th I mean, I think we would pick up when you see how uh, bad that delirium can be post-operatively or in the ICU, we're not seeing that preoperative to that degree. Now, is there a portion of uh, decline or um, uh, impaired mental function that we could pick up if we did some testing? I think that's, that's probably a, a, something that maybe we should include um, in our pre-assessment of patients coming through to have surgery, anesthesia, sedation. Uh, I think that may be a good point. I think the trouble is when it when it's if it's slowly a slow onset, the family don't really recognise it, and um, you know, the, the, so you're not going to get the answers you want unless you do a really sophisticated uh, test. And uh, I'm not sure people have made the time to do that at this point, but maybe we should. That's Another question, question from the audience. Yes. Hi, Shema Hassan uh, Faisal from Australia. Um, you mentioned uh, among the insults. Uh, Hypoxia to yeah. be contributing to the uh, brain injury. What about hyperoxia? Yes. We actually, how much do you know? We know that uh, recently we are reducing the uh, oxygen saturation for people who have problem with the cardiac uh, injury. And uh, these days we are starting in Australia um, uh, research uh, the out of the hospital uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, what is the effect of the hyperoxia to the brain injury. How much do we know about hyperoxia in these patients? Oh, I think that, that's a really excellent point. It's another area we should be looking closely at. We do know hyperoxia over time is bad. We know in the younger patients, the neonates, that hyperoxia is extremely bad, particularly for uh, eyesight, for the retina. Uh, but I think that's a great question. I think uh, 
again, if we start to monitor the brain, we start to uh, and focus on the brain, I think we've done the heart. I mean, we kind of know what's going on with the heart. We've got echoes, etc. cetera. Uh, we now need to apply the same intensity to looking at the brain and all the factors that can affect the brain uh, and uh, put that now as the, the, the next priority because uh, you know, we can't afford, until you get to my age, you can't afford to lose your cognition. You really can't. We've got some activity on the app, actually. This is quite good. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions regarding the use of um, sedation monitoring in ICU patients and specifically regarding the use of BIS. I suppose if we all take as read that unnecessary sedation in the ICU is a bad thing, um, we still are left with our patients that have an indication for quite deep sedation. So what do you think is the best way to monitor depth of sedation in those patients and do you think there's a role for, for BIS monitoring? I think uh, we ought to be monitoring the electrical activity of the brain and probably also the oxygenation of the brain. I think we ought to be monitoring both because as you just heard, uh, too much oxygen, too little oxygen, these can hurt the brain. It's uh, relatively easy to monitor the electrical activity. It's certainly a lot easier now to understand it. If you can see spectrograms, it makes it a little easier uh, uh, to, to uh, see what's going on. Uh, and um, why not have measure the oxygen as well that's going into the brain? Uh, that seems to me to be uh, just another natural. So uh, I, I think we should do both, particularly when you've lost the interaction with the patient. Once you've taken them down to that level where they're not going to interact with you, we need to know how deep they are because they could be uh, you know, just unconscious or they could be comatosed. And we do know that uh, burst suppression, which is coma, um, is not good for elderly brains. It's probably not good for younger brains either, but they've got the uh, fortitude to come back and uh, overcome any disruption of the electrical activity that we don't detect the problem. But in the elderly patient, I don't think they can come back. And I think that's where we see some of the uh, uh, dementia that uh, has been talked about. We have a couple of participants who have asked about the risks of depth of sedation um, causing neurocognitive impairment versus the risk of awareness in, um, in surgery, which I suppose is uh, partly answered by your question regarding monitoring. Um, apart from uh, uh, surgery, I suppose there's also the question about whether being too lightly sedated might in some situations be bad for an ICU patient. Um, can you make any comment on the risks associated with being under sedated and how to balance those with the risk of overuse of sedative medications? Yeah. I think, um, first of all, as we came up with the guidelines uh, on the last SCCM guidelines, treat pain. To be under sedated and in pain is obviously intolerable and, and incredibly bad. So I think we've got to make sure our patients are comfortable. But once they're comfortable, then what's the concern about being light? Is being terrified by what's going on around you? Well, then, is that environment around that patient something that's horrific and, and going to terrify them? Or have we got somebody communicating with the patient? And, uh, you know, I think we've got to sort of start thinking that, uh, you know, this is a human being and perhaps we should be interacting, particularly if we know we're running them light. Um, but again, it comes back to monitoring. You should be able to tell if you've got somebody in that zone of not being totally responsive to you, that uh, are they light, are they deep? Um, and, and, and what, what depth of sedation are they at? But I think you've got to humanize the ICU. I think um, uh, we don't want our patients too deep for too long unless it's absolutely clinically necessary. So if we're going to run them lighter, at least uh, make sure there's somebody interacting with the patient, talking to them, uh, touching them. Maybe there's some music in the background. Uh, you know, the, the ICU is a pretty horrific place if you sit back and imagine yourself as a patient and you hear the noise, the conversation, the shouting that's going on, somebody's getting coded over there. Uh, so I think we've got to try and make it a little bit more humane. Uh, then perhaps we don't need such a deep sedation. But again, I think it comes back, we ought to monitor the patients. I like your suggestion of modifying the environment rather than modifying the patients. Yeah. Um, We'll just do one more question uh, because we need to get on to the opening ceremony next. Um, this is from Dr. Alhadi Alfian Yusuf, and it asks whether um, you aim to tracheostomize your patients earlier in an effort to then be able to 
wake them up and reduce sedation? Or do you find that you're able to use less sedation in your patients with an oral endotracheal tube rather than needing to perform a tracheotomy? It's quite common in Australia to tracheotomise patients and then um, with part of the, uh, the uh, hope being that you can then decrease their amount of sedation and they'll be more comfortable. Yeah, that uh, that's experience? an interesting question. It's probably another talk. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, if, if we see we're going into a long-term problem, we've done some lung transplants and uh, we've clearly got a problem with those lungs, they're, they're going to take a while to settle down, we'll track that patient and uh, we will have them res wake responsive. Um, uh, if, if it's going to be very short-term, then we stay with a tube. Uh, although we've gone to non-invasive ventilating a little bit more as well. So, and again, can you manage that not sedating the patient? I think most of them we can actually.